Hart and Risley are pretty uh, impressive people. Both of them are deceased at this point, unfortunately, because um, this would be, to be at a meeting like this would be, um, for them, the dream of a lifetime. Uh, Todd is here, this is, is Todd Risley in uh, Turner House Preschool in, in Kansas City, Kansas, with Uriel Owens, who is a, a community leader. Um, and Todd was uh, uh, himself an absolute innovator. Uh, he was a, a person who, in many ways, um, absolutely wanted to change the world. Um, put his heart and soul into that in many respects for, uh, for many years. Uh, was it just one of the most productive scholars probably you would ever run into. And then in 1981, uh, he returned to, uh, uh, to Alaska, where he had grown as, up as a kid. In an Alaska, he grew up in an Alaska long before the cruise boats. And he, retu he returned to Risley Mountain, where he had grown up. Uh, his mother was there, and he went home basically to take care of her, and he joined the faculty of the University of Alaska at Fairbanks and, and remained actually active at the University of Kansas as a collaborator of Betty Hart. But uh, Todd is his own unique story, and I won't go into that today, but um, a remarkable man in his own right. This is, of course, his famous colleague, uh, Betty Hart. Um, this is Betty uh, <laughs> uh, looking at the most advanced technology that existed at the time that um, <laughs> that she uh, and Todd did the work. Um, and this was actually really, this was a lot more advanced than most of what they, they worked with. Um, Betty uh, was a remarkable individual in, in many ways, in some ways a, a character. Uh, she was um, uh, a little bit of a loner. She was uh, a person who was absolutely dedicated to something, that, things that actually really did matter. Um, if you ever read her, her academic vita, there's only 29 publications on it. For somebody who was an academic researcher, that's not a very long list. But if you look at the number of those publications that have large citation counts and made a real difference in the world, it just makes everything, makes a lot of us look like um, we're more interested in counting than having an impact. Let's just put it that way. Um, her, if you want to know more about Betty, um, actually one of her best, uh, probably maybe her best friend in the world, is Dale Walker, who's here. And uh, three of her colleagues in, her, in the work that she did are Dale Walker, Charlie Greenwood, and Judy Carter from the Juniper Gardens Children's Project. So they're here. They can tell you a lot of stories about both of these folks if you want to. And they're still very much celebrated back in Kansas all the time. Uh, and last, one last little comment about the place where all this work went on. Juniper Gardens Children's Project is a um, urban-based research center. It's an, out, sort of an outreach center, in a way, of the University of Kansas. Um, it was started in the 1960s in the basement of a liquor store in Kansas City during a very difficult time uh, in, the, in the history of Kansas City and many cities. Um, and it, it grew up in, the, in an environment that um, uh, kept it very close to those communities. It was uh, um, uh, absolutely a pioneer in many different respects. And what's wonderful is next weekend they'll celebrate their 50th anniversary as a research center. And an environment like that is pretty amazing. So this is uh, <laughs> the times that Betty was, Hart was from in Todd Risley. This was a, an important piece of equipment <laughs> when you were uh, going out and doing research, a stop watch and a clipboard. Some of you, uh, there's a few of you old enough to remember this. Um, and, uh, and then a tape recorder, if you were going to actually re record what was going on in, in, in an environment. It was, a, it was a very, very different period of time, technology-wise and in many other ways. And so actually, I was trying to think back to the 80s. And it was, it's a long time ago. I, couldn't, I realized that I, I was mixing up the 70s, the 60s, the 80s, maybe even the early 90s sometimes as I was trying to think about it. But uh, those, that's important because that's when this work was done. Uh, it, in the early, the data was collected. Charlie Greenwood and I were trying to figure this out the other day. And exactly when was this collected? The data was, took a long time to analyze after it was collected. Uh, the technology was so primitive, and the data for Hart and Risley was really collected in the early to mid-80s primarily. Um, the technology was obviously primitive. Um, the personal computer, some of those you remember, actually arrived about the middle of the 1980s. Um, we had a computer that was a standalone kind of thing at, the, at KU in, the, in what was then the larger research center, the Lifespan Institute, but it was like any computer those days. Um, you, you spent a lot of time sticking a lot of stuff into it, and eventually it would stick something back out to you, and then you try to figure out what it was. 
And uh, what I remember when a personal computer arrived, well, I won't even go into that. Those were little plastic things, 64K. You could type a letter on them and maybe a 20-page manuscript. The internet, nobody, I think it was a dream. It was something that the, uh, the CIA had or somebody like that, people would say, but nobody else did. Um, and, you know, from the standpoint of how we thought about human behavior in the 80s, um, <clears throat> there, was a, there, were, there was a lot of things going on <clears throat> that you can see the fruits of them today. But there were also a lot of sort of, it was a time when people were still talking often about genes as, as sort of unmalleable and your genes were your destiny in a way that we know is, is not really true in, in many cases anymore. Um, a lot of things like developmental neuroscience, which is now in, in you know, in the prominent part of the scene was, it was, it existed, but it was, it was pretty primitive at that point. Um, we still had a lot of influence on these old, not old ideas, because the ideas had a lot of validity to them, but the behaviorism and, and psychoanalytic approaches were still represented largely on, on campuses and a lot of ideas that, um, you know, had champions and that they were, they were important periods to go through, but they still dominated the academic scenes. We had a lot of big arguments. And those big arguments were really due to big theories. And the collaboration that started really taking off in the 80s and the 90s and, and has since dominated the academic research world really wasn't present yet. It was a little bit more of a battle of paradigms in those days. Um, and we were also living in the res residue of, the, of a, the failed war on poverty. Uh, when Juniper Gardens started, it started because um, Kansas City was a mess. Uh, inner city Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas were um, difficult places that were experiencing extraordinary changes. And yes, they were exp experiencing riots and all sorts of unrest. And you know, the war on poverty itself um, was underway. But it, by the 1980s, the war on poverty was pretty much a failure. It hadn't worked. And um, Todd and, and Betty actually had been involved uh, in an effort at Turner Preschool, for example, to create a preschool model that would take kids who grew up, you know, as very young children came out of difficult situations and get them in a preschool when they were three and get them into first grade and, and have them be caught up enough that they were going to succeed in first grade. And in many respects, what led to the Hart and Risley study was the failure of that model to achieve that, the, the failure of a model to make up between the ages of three and five or three and six what had not occurred between birth and three. And that's really, in many respects, the, the roots of, of the study that they, that they conducted. So I think myself, uh, I've always thought this, that it was it, within its context of the times, of those 1980s and then the early 90s, you know, when, when the data started to come out of, out of the Hart and Risley effort, first publications came out and then the landmark book in 95, um, it would be an understatement to say that that was, that was groundbreaking. I mean, it, it was because there was nothing like it that existed. And when it came out, and it came out in pieces, some published papers in, in some major journals, um, and then uh, the book itself, um, you know, it didn't matter what your background was, what your theory was of child development, how you thought about parenting, you needed to read it because it staked out a new set of facts on the ground about something that people had, some other people, other people had, had, had believed this was the case, but nobody had a data set like this. It just didn't exist. And uh, in 94, actually I want to call out, uh, so the, the Juniper Gardens crowd here a little bit, um, one of the key publications that doesn't get talked about very much that came out right before the book version of Heart and Rizzo that most people have read, was a study that was published in Child Development in 1994. The authors were uh, Dale Walker, present here, Charlie Greenwood, Betty Hart, and Judy Carta. And it was published, uh, the study was entitled Prediction of School Outcomes Based on Early Language Production and Social Economic Factors. It was published in Child Development. And what it took was the Hart and Risley data and said, and here's what happens later on in elementary school. This is what this data predicts. And then the book itself came out in 1994. The book itself was a brilliant tactical move if you want to think about a tactic. It wasn't an academic journal article. There were already academic journal articles. It was an extremely accessible book that anybody could read um, and understand what was going on. 
When that book came out, I um, was teaching at Vanderbilt University, and I had an undergraduate language development course. Um, and I took the book, and what I would do then with my students, the rest of the time I was at Vanderbilt, um, is I would give them that book at the start of the semester, and I would say, you're going to read this book over the next three weeks, then we're going to go to work on the course. Okay? These kids would take this book. They'd never read anything like this in their life. They'd never even thought about these issues, but it was so accessible that three weeks later, they were so excited about, less, about language development, about why it's important and how it really occurs and what you can do to change its course. And so the book itself coming out in that format was a really critical thing. It wasn't, there were academic journal, journal articles there, but it, it stood alone as something that anybody could pick up and read and, and then really understand what this was all about. So, um, you know, there were, if, if you read the study, uh, now, it's a little dated in, in a sense, in a way, although it's relevant as ever could be. But it, there, there were some limitations to it. I mean, you have to be honest, of course. It was a representative sample, but it did not have, it did not include the most, least, or the least stable, most, most vulnerable parents. It didn't include those families. You had to be stable enough that somebody was going to come and visit your house and you were going to welcome them in the door and you were going to do that for a, a significant period of time. And, you know, the only criticism, the only thing I can say about that is very few studies pull that off. That is still the hardest thing for any of us to do, and that was the hardest thing for them to do as well. Most of their observations uh, were actually taken in the late afternoon and the early evening. That's, that's when parents wanted them to come in. And it just turns out, <laughs> uh, other studies have replicated this, that if you want to find the richest average time for parent-child uh, you know, interaction, uh, go someplace, go, go visit the home in the late afternoon and the early evening. That's, that's often where it really is. So in a sense, if you, they extrapolated their data from that, and they probably overestimated the amount of talk that was going on. If you tried to think about it you know, all day long, they were. Okay, so um, that was a, that's, a, that's a minor, I would say very minor flaw, but it's, you know, um, it's there. Um, and the, the data collection was potentially susceptible to something called the Hawthorne effect, which means, you know, there's an observer present during that hour every month who's sitting there writing down things and there's a tape recorder on. So it's certainly possible you could get the best that a family had at that point uh, because of that. I, I don't think that is something that the Hawthorne effect uh, explains much of the data at all. The data is very orderly and is explained very well um, by the arguments that, that it was built on. Um, so I guess the other thing that people said, what I said when it first came out is, you know, I don't think anybody's going to replicate this study. This thing was too hard to do. It took too much time and too much money and you know, that's, that's one of the things is we just, this is what we got now, we're going to have to live with it for a while. Um, now that said, that's really not true. That's not how it's turned out. Uh, I would say what Hart and Risley discovered uh, and revealed to the rest of us in 1995 and in the publications right before that uh, has been affirmed in a variety of ways over the past 20 years. Uh, a variety, uh, uh, Susan Landry's here, Susan Landry's work on maternal responsivity is a great example of coming at this issue slightly different way, but looking at the parent-child interaction and its relationship to language and emotion and social development and cognition. There's many other people who've done the same things in this sphere. And, and actually, the ideas behind Hart and Risley have been quite well replicated, finally, actually. And they were actually replicated by the Lena Foundation in its initial study of, what, 636 families in the in the Denver area. So it's a really well replicated finding at this point, and I think uh, a setting piece that all of us have to take into account when we think about child development and what influences it. So, you know, the point about the, the size of the effect, I mean, 30 million words, uh, whatever, we could all argue about that absolute size. It's an irrelevant argument. It doesn't matter. Frequency does matter. That is absolutely clear from any study that you look at is, the amount of talk makes a difference. And that logically makes sense, that um, the amount of talk makes a, a difference. So we don't have to worry about, is it 20 million words, is it 15 million words, is it 30 million words, irrelevant. I want to talk about two other fundamental findings that have been talked about some, talked about some here too, but I think were not as noticed in that study as the word gap itself, which is you know, stunning when you see it. So, I'm a, the two points I'm going to talk about are 
I think uh, the first one is, is really as close to a, a law of physics in human behavior as you'll ever find. Now, it's not a true law of physics, but it's so lawful that it's remarkable. And here it is. If a parent only talks a little to their child, whether they uh, have an MIT degree or they didn't finish eighth grade and everything in between, okay, they're going to have a certain amount of their talks that are in initiations that have to do, that are primarily directives, and just have to do with the business of living day to day. We all do that. Everybody does that. You have to do that to get through a day, right? So that's the commonality that we all have, all right? Here's the law of, the law of physics part of it, though. If a parent talks a lot, gets, way, gets beyond all that management talk, the extra talk will, will be conversation most likely, turn-taking types of conversations that we've been talking about, and reading. It's going to be a lot of those kinds of things. That's the rich talk, the rich vocabulary that you learn as a child from your parents and you don't even know you're learning it. And that's really what more talk is about. It's about that kind of talk that goes beyond what all of us do in the parenting role day in and day out. So and this is the third, the second point that I want to make is that more importantly perhaps than that sort of law of physics that I, I mentioned is the style of parenting that's associated with low rates of, of interaction over long periods of time versus higher rates of interaction uh, that we saw in the, in, the, in the best outcomes in Hart and Risley. So this is, and this is right from their observations, it's been replicated many times that um, low rates of parent-child in initiation over long periods of time suggest uh, often are dominated by a potentially toxic ratio of prohibitions to encouragements. Now they use the terms prohibitions and encouragements, but they're talking about you know, statements like stop that, don't do that, you can't do that, put that down, shut up, no, we're not going to do that now, sit down, you get out of my face, get out of the way in front of the TV. All parents do that, by the way. But, <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I've done that. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to implicate any of you. But, but for mothers who talk the least in the Hart and Risley study, that reported ratio of affirmatives like, oh, that's interesting. What do you got there? Let me, can I play that with you? Let's talk. You know, those affirmative things, think about how those affect your self concept. Their ratio that they saw in those families, the lowest talkers were one affirmative to every two prohibitions. Now think about what that environment feels like if you're a kid. It's a negative environment. I'm going to keep quiet. I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not going to talk. I don't want to interact with you, okay? I don't want to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to get scolded. I'm going to get whatever. It's not going to be a good time, all right? And on the other side of that, the mothers who talk to most of their children, that ratio was six affirmatives to every one prohibition. So yeah, once in a while, I kind of get in trouble a little bit. But mostly I'm getting a lot of things affirmed in my conversations with my, with my parents. I like to talk to my mom. I like to talk to my dad. Because we are talking. We're discussing things. Or we're reading together. We're doing those kinds of things. So, you know, that ratio is, reflects stunningly different environments to grow up in. Stunningly different environments to grow up with. And I think that aspect of their study, which is, again, this has been replicated in other studies, is as important, maybe more important, well, in fact, I, personally, I think it is more important, which is why we keep talking about turns, turns, turns are so important, than the total amount of talk itself, as important as that might be. So those were, those were breakthrough kind of di discoveries that, you know, Todd and Betty, you know, what they always said is they, they collected the data and they didn't really see the relationships that were there when they would go visit these homes. People would welcome them in and they would, these were stable families and everybody was, had lots of things that were positive. They saw the patterns when they saw the longitudinal data. And that's really what it's all about. It's about the cumulative experience from one, two, three, four, five years and up that really shapes development. Not this day or that day. And those were the patterns that they saw in the data and that really, um, that really formed that, that focus on, on words and turns and all those sorts of things. So, you know, that, that point that it's not just talking more um, is, you know, 
the hallmark of that, again, replicated in many other people's studies and, and identified in studies before Hart and Risley, was that you know, turn-taking with a kid is the hallmark of a responsive style of parenting. Okay? Uh, one in which the parent follows the child's attentional lead, which is critical in early development with kids under age three. You know, they can, you can start directing attention later on, uh, but in the first three years of life, following their attentional lead is how you know what to talk about with them, what they're interested in, what motivates them. And that gives you the opportunity to build on those child's interests and just naturally, steadily expand your, their vocabulary without ever even thinking about it. You're just led by the child if you engage in this style. You bring in things like books and things like that into the conversation and they become the scaffold under which these convers on which these conversations occur. So the effects are, are not just on language either. Uh, again, uh, Susan Landry and other people have shown these, these broader effects on cognition, on social development, on emotional development, um, it's really, uh, uh, the breadth is, is stunning when you think about it. And it really shows how important parenting really is, especially early in development. So I think another point about this is that a highly responsive style of parenting is actually not difficult to learn. People learn it all the time. You can teach it. It's not, there's, it's not you know, that difficult. Anybody can learn to do it. But the key is not being able to do it. It's establishing it as a normal, routine part of interacting every day, as, as is establishing it as your primary style of interacting with your young child. And if you can get, a, a, particularly a new mother, um, first time kid, uh, you know, you get to them in the first few months uh, with a, a you know, um, lean a start or whatever, and you focus on establishing that sort of turn-taking, highly responsive relationship before the routines get set, which they do in childhood and which they do in parenting, that's your best shot. You get there early, you establish the routines, you help them establish them before the routines are already established by, their, by life as they are anyway. So there really is something that's awfully important about that first six months or so uh, that give us an opportunity to maybe to, to not have to overcome something that gets established in the routine of any parent. So I think that's, that's the, in, one of, in some respects, that's the point about, about what, what's so really critical about the early period. 